Thank you, everybody. Very pleased to be here. Um, I'll talk about the workshops at the end, actually, because one or two things I want to say about them. Hopefully, I'm projecting enough for the people at the back. Do let me know if I start dropping on the volume. You can't hear me. Just put your hand up, please. Also, I'm completely open to questions during. I'm, I aim to give this talk in about 40, 45 minutes. Is there anyone who can give me a 10-minute uh, signal? Yeah, if you could let me know after 40 minutes, that would be great. Um, yes, so as Phil has said, I am here um, on a residency. I come to you from Bristol. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'll tell you about the title of this talk, actually. I, I'm, I've given a couple of talks for skeptics recently. One of those was AI for skeptics. I don't know whether there are any AI researchers in the, in the room, but um, I'm skeptical <coughs> about the, the discourse around AI. And one of the books I, I looked at was What Computers Can't Do. I don't know whether you're familiar with that, by uh, Hubert Dreyfus. Um, but I'm here to emphasize the creative angle on um, what computers can do, hence the title. Hence also a skeptical. I'm going to tell you why I'm skeptical, what skeptical means for me. Skeptical, unreasonable and creative approach. So the theme of my talk is going to be about a question that I have and I know many people have. They have this question about cities, let alone universities, or the other way around, I should say. Innovation, instead of the work of a lone <coughs> genius, Newton, Apple falls down, has great idea, founds a lot of our knowledge. Can you design a system that helps you innovate towards your goals and your uh, objectives in relation to social value, whatever your value system is? What would it mean to have such a system and can you construct one? That actually is my question for this residency. And I begin um, by telling you, though, about myself, so you know roughly what my background is, and then you know what kind of context to give to the remarks I make. So I'm going to come back to that question, and you'll see this later, and you'll understand what's happening in that picture. This is my usual picture of my career. You have to start in the top left-hand corner and go clockwise. Um, you perhaps can just recognise someone who's approximately half my age and is me um, in that picture on the top left-hand corner. That is me um, with my first ever startup company, actually, um, and also doing a PhD. We're sitting there in the West End, and I, me and Andrew, my colleague, are leaning against a rack of 10 commodity processor boards. And actually, it wasn't called that then because this was before the web existed, but we were doing cloud computing. We happened to be doing it on parallel processing workloads, but we had put commodity processors <coughs> in a rack, and we, I designed and we built a system for dispatching intensive workloads across a centralised facility for computing. I moved to Queen Mary, and I was a senior lecturer at Queen Mary. I'm co-author of a book on distributed computer systems. I then uh, moved to California to Hewlett Packard Laboratories in Palo Alto, where I worked on pervasive or ubiquitous computing for, well, I began to work on it for that spate of four years. And actually, what's kind of happened between there and there is I've gone from hardcore systems to much more of an emphasis on the human factors of computing and what the user experience of systems is. So ubiquitous and pervasive computing, if you're not from, these terms are rarely used nowadays, um, but we all do it, is the idea that instead of computing being concentrated in boxes and even in phones, it's everywhere. It's in the chairs, it's in the building, it's in the, um, uh, the garden, it's in absolutely everything we can think of. And everything has computational affordances, and you design systems so that instead of people staring into screens all the time, 
objects around this have computational behaviours which are useful to people in wherever they happen to be. Um, I'll talk about working at HP Labs. I came back to Bristol, um, worked there for six years, again working on pervasive computing. And I left there and I went to a place which HP Labs actually was one of the founders of, which is the Pervasive Media Studio. I'm going to talk about that in a bit as well, which is a very distinctive kind of research environment. But from this point onwards, I have been running my own small digital technology company. I would probably say creative digital technology company. And I've created a range of products, which I will briefly talk about along there. And I do consulting, um, but I am a practitioner. I write code, uh, I build systems. And just to talk about a selection of those projects, again, so you can get a flavour of the kind of work I do. <coughs> so um, we had this idea in a project at HP Labs. Our, our idea of ubiquitous computing was that you had the web of things. It was really the first project that ever had that idea. Obviously, the Internet of Things has been around. I know we're all talking about the Internet of Things now, but Internet of Things, 1999, right? Web of Things, not long afterwards. That was the idea that everything has a web presence. So I talked about computers being, comp about computation being everywhere. But it was about the idea that ev everywhere is a hyperlink to something. So I wander around with my mouse. It was a personal digital assistant. Does anyone else remember those in those days? Did more or less what this does, except it didn't have a phone bit. And um, I could touch it to things, scan it, scan it, point the camera at things, and that would vector me through to some information about something or a service in relation to something. So I could walk into the room, find out about the room, automatically connect all my equipment to the projection facility, um, book the room again, and th the room would have services, and I could wander around with this mouse, and the world is a web page. And everything happens by communication to and from HTTP resources. And we did this project at the Exploratorium, which is like one of the world's first um, scientific uh, active museums, and we built, we built various technologies for physical hyperlinks all around the museum. So the idea is it was one of the world's first ever electronic visitors guidebooks. You could wander around with your device, you could point your device at things and find out information about the exhibits. And actually it was a really kind of bit of a seminal project for me because we were looking, we had this system that we'd built but we were looking at the human factors on it. And, and the fact that we looked at the human factors completely reversed what we did in that place. So we started out with a model where you went in with one of these and you used it as a vector to information and we ended up with a system whereby you went around with a thing a bit like a, well, nowadays it's routine contactless payment card uh, or an Oyster card if you like and you, your way of interacting with things was to actually touch this token that you carried with you to the exhibits and it completely changed where you had your attention while you were wandering around the Science Museum. And it shifted the, the whole time base of your visit from things happening while you were going around to a record of your visit that you looked at afterwards. So it completely changed the interleaving of your electronic experience with your physical experience of this place. Many years later, in Bristol, I worked with a couple of interactive theatre companies who were developing experiences for people actually to re-experience the cities they lived in. And um, we used, or they used, a whole variety of ways of communicating people. It was a sort of polymorphous communication system that we built. So there was Twitter involved, there was email involved, there was actually handwritten letters involved delivered under people's doors at midnight. This is a theatre company. So there was a kind of drama to a, a technology, it's exactly the same technology in terms of radio frequency identification that we had used all those years back in the San Francisco Exploratorium. But it was now being used to create an experience for people. 
And instead of wandering around one particular location, a science museum, you could wander around locations, arbitrary locations, not arbitrary locations, but locations dotted around the city. So we were really building an app for a city. It was something which, again, was vectored via your mobile phone, but it was an application that ran in a city. And it was first, first ran in Bristol, but then they ran it again in Manchester, Nottingham, other cities, just by rejigging it, reconfiguring it. And the idea is that everybody had, not just their mobile with them, but a piece of jewellery which contained something a bit like in an Oyster card or in your contactless payment card. And they were communicated with and they would touch this to um, various places around the city. And when they did that, some kind of magic would happen. So things switched on, suddenly the lights went on or off, uh, took your picture. Uh, ten minutes later, you got an SMS because we knew that you had visited that place and there was a text, a communication from somebody else in relation to that. So we built this whole system and I actually turned it into a platform for extended experiences of cities. I think I'm going to have to speed up a bit, actually. Video turntable. Um, I'm very interested in video and film and new ways of experiencing those things. And so instead of all, all of us going to, see, um, going to the cinema to see a film, what if we could stand around a circular table, a bit like a camera obscura, and watch a film that was projected down? Just a casual experience of some content. It could be a YouTube video. But we're just having a conversation around that table. Above it, there's a projection system and a camera that's doing presence detection. And it projects content that you have, you have chosen, again, by associating your mobile phone with the table, onto the um, table in front of you. So you have an intimate social experience of film. And, and it, the idea was to transform um, your experience of film, to make it into an intimate social experience like that. To cut a long story short, this was a both a hardware proposition and a software platform proposition. And it was the first of my hardware propositions that I failed to turn into a viable economic model. I can't say it can't be done, but the uh, way that you do business, obviously, with hardware is very different than the way you do business with software. So um, I, put it, I did it at various um, festivals, but I haven't actually succeeded in turning that into a business. Then I was approached by, um, again, um, a theatre slash show company in uh, London who had a multi-segment film about climate change. And they wanted to run the segments of that film on mobile phones in synchrony. And that reminded me of something I did way, way back when, when I was doing my PhD. One of the ways we would exhibit the behaviours of multiple computers working together is each computer has a screen and we had this kind of animated creature that would leave one screen and appear on the next screen and then go onto the next screen. And if you switched one of those computers off, it would know not to go onto that screen anymore and to jump over and go into that. So we had this really sort of silly demonstration of something. And uh, so I'd already worked in multi-screen actually and I built a system to synchronise the content on mobile phones for playback. So imagine, if you will, for a moment, something which we, we, we did, that birds started tweeting out of everyone's mobile phones in this room. And not only are the birds tweeting out of the mobile phones, but the birds are flying from phone to phone. So you can hear the sound of a bird leaving your phone and flying, and you can hear the sound of a bird landing on your phone and continuing to sing with the same. So you could create an experience for a crowd that's predicated on synchronised video. In fact, that ex particular experience works even if it's just audio because it's all about the sound. And that's all controlled from any phone. So anybody can press play, if you like, and the whole thing will play. And it's any collection of phones, and you don't have to be in the same place. So I worked on that project. This was funded by REACT, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is an AHRC-funded scheme 
for funding collaborations between people in the humanities and techn technology companies in the creative sector. And I was working with an academic film editor and a transmedia author with whom we concocted this whole idea of birds. There's lots of other applications of this, but birds was one particularly compelling one. During that workshop, I had a workshop with filmmakers because this was a new form of film, to make films that run on configurable collections of mobile phones. It's not multi-screen as we already, we already knew it, which is fixed division of the screen. This is actually completely dynamic. So I can make an application where a character is roving around the phones. You switch on your phone and add it. The character moves onto your phone. It's dynamic. It's dynamic multi-screen. We had a workshop about with filmmakers to... Um, and this is a great example of, of what, it's, what, what happens when you work with people in different disciplines. We had a workshop with filmmakers and we wanted to make some video clips that would be synchronised on the phones to make a film like this. But the thing we discovered when we held the workshop was actually filming together was fun. So we tried just filming on our ordinary mobiles without any special app, all going one, two, three, record to synchronise the recording. And um, actually here... That is me filmed by multiple people. It's a kind of Picasso version of me because I'm standing there and people are recording like my ear, my knee, my, my arm and making a sort of a, a, um, a composite view of, of me. Okay? It's the kind of thing you can do. <laughs> film, right? But we discovered that that was fun and so that was a light bulb moment for me. So that was working with filmmakers to do something which I probably never would have thought of myself which is that recording together is fun. And so I, you can go to nthscreen.tv and download this app. It, it, it will, it will synchronise your Android phones or your iPhones and m allow you to make a collective, multi-viewpoint, synchronised image of anything you want. It could be a scientific experiment. It could be um, a party. It could be anything. And then you upload those videos and you make a mosaic of them. So the philosophy, the value of it is to um, retain everybody's viewpoint, not to make a s conventional linear edit from the viewpoints, but to make a simultaneous uh, presentation of all those in a mosaic. Um, got a commission, so that was a free app that I just put out there, but we got a commission from BBC, from the iWonder team, because they wanted to look into how one can better understand something by filming it together would be a, a, as an example of that. Then I got a commission um, in the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta 2015 based on that work to work with young people around the world about human rights. So I took that concept this idea of filming something together, and I turned it into an act of solidarity. The idea would be that no matter where you were, at a certain time on International Youth Day, in 12.15pm, because the year was 12.15, on International Youth Day, you would <coughs> hold the phone in selfie mode, spin, because there was a kind of theme of time, but also it might, meant that other people could see your context, and talk about the human right you cared the most about. And with very little budget, I mean, these numbers are nothing by, you know, three million hits on YouTube to somebody doing their makeup, but um, 180 videos from 12 countries filmed at the same time in quotes, because what I discovered was that almost nobody did it at the same time. So people kept saying to me, you know that nobody's going to do it at the same time, don't you? And I said, no, 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 they will. And they didn't. Uh, but fortunately, um, because we live in an increasingly asynchronous world, right? People don't do things at the same time anymore. Um, fortunately, because people have put enough doubt in my head, you could film beforehand and the film would go into a kind of time vault so nobody else would see it. And then at that moment, it got posted on Instagram. So everything went out on Instagram anyway. Um, I collected all those videos and I made because it's a global project, an interactive moving sphere of all those videos as a symbolic way of viewing the ensemble together. 
that you can interact with in a web page. And that was the, the death of the idea for me that I had beaten my head against for so long that people would film synchronously. I knew that they would, if, like if I have a workshop on this, and it's kind of magic because, you know, I press record on my phone and all your phones start recording. People love it if you bring them together and do it. But if you just leave something out in the world, it's too many steps away from what people know and they don't do it. I mean, maybe they'd do it if I had £100,000 in PR, but I didn't. Okay. So I built another platform after that. I'm, I'm trying to just sort of communicate to you the twists and turns of what someone like me goes through and why. So I thought, OK, I'm going to retain the idea that people film collectively. I'm also still going to make an interactive sphere out of it. But I will, I will lose the idea that what pulls that what pulls them together is time, and I'll make it a hashtag. So if you agree on the hashtag and you upload your video to, in those days it was Instagram or Twitter, on that hashtag, my system will pull those videos out, give you a chance to curate them, and make the sphere. And that was um, Twitter's 10th anniversary party in London. They, so we actually did it on a physical sphere, which is... Wonderful, but cost a lot of money. Um, there's a company in Edinburgh, if you ever, ever want one, that I can put you in touch with. So I've been through a sort of whole course of different ideas with video, and um, there's another idea with video that I'm also very interested in that's sort of come up for me again recently, which is mixing video with live performances. So that actually is a performance that was, have, took place in Lincoln Castle, of a play in which the idea of which was that people suffering from hu terrible human rights regimes in other parts of the world had projected themselves electronically into the space, the historic space of Lincoln Castle, where, of course, the original Magna Carta was signed and is kept. And so these young people are actually carrying the videos of these projected people into it. So it's just a way of bringing video content into a live performance. And then very recently, I did this a few months ago, this was a project between, a uh, British Council funded project between uh, Bristol, Kigali and Kampala. And the idea was to have a simultaneous performance by young people in those three places. And I built a live streaming technology, which is a bit like Skype on steroids in the sense that instead of everything being combined into one box, you can have a collection of mobile phones, which are video sources and microphone sources around. And then the whole thing gets projected. And that was part of a live performance. So a few months back, I was in the control room with a live performance trying to, on WhatsApp, trying to talk to people in Kigali and Kampala because the whole system had just gone down. Um, and they were getting to the point in the show uh, when it all had to go live, and it was like the big moment in the show. And um, I'm also having to talk to the cast members. And um, so older male guys can uh, multitask anyway. That's, uh, um, and that's it. That's kind of a flavour of what I do in my life. I've told you almost nothing about the computer science research I did. I've tried to stick to the bits that involve computer science, and technology from a variety of disciplines. But just to give you a flavour of, I hope I've conveyed how interesting and exciting it is actually to work with other people in the arts in particular on projects. So now I'm going to come back to this question of innovation not as the curious production of a lone genius or a lone indivi uh, individual, but um, where one creates a system in order that you try and bring innovation about towards some end. What kind of thing is that? And I'm just going to tell you about the ones I know about, really. Um, first of all, that, in, that system may actually just consist of you. So in my spare time, I do creative writing. And I was thinking... Now, creative writing is, a, is an interesting thing, right? I mean, stuff just appears in your head and you write it down. But actually, I do have a system for creative writing, and, and many people do. And I don't know whether any of you read... Um, in the Saturday Guardian, there's a, there's a fascinating thing about writers and what they do and what their methodology is. 
And it always involves, usually involves a fixed space, okay, a room of one's own, right, as to, to quote Virginia Woolf. It always involves space, often involves a time. And so, and every writer will be different, but the first thing that any writer will tell you is that you need to turn up to the desk. Maybe nothing's going to happen that morning, maybe something is going to happen that morning, but you turn up to the desk and you write, is the first rule. And that is a method, okay? If I don't turn up to the desk, nothing's going to happen. So there's a kind of discipline involved in there. The other thing is that when do I turn up? This isn't my room, by the way, it's someone else's room. When do I turn up to the desk? I turn up to the desk early in the morning. Now, I, I work all day, so it's not going to be during the day. Could be later in the evening. But there's a particular property that I find my brain has first thing in the morning, which is the, um, the inner critic has not woken up yet. And this is definitely true of me. It might, I think it's true of many people. The inner critic has not woken up yet. And the bit that's still kind of doing a bit of dreaming has. And I find that if I write <laughs> that time in the morning, I'm far more productive than if I write later on. The other thing is that I don't write into the computer. I write in longhand in an exercise book. And the reason I do that is that to the extent that, to which the inner critic is alive and well at that point, if I've written into the computer, that guy is going to undo everything I've just written and think better of it and rewrite it. And I will go round and round and round. If I uh, write in longhand, of course you can cross stuff out and everything, but I make far more progress in actually getting text down. I have chosen, in other words, to um, phase the creative process in a particular way. Because I know, and every writer knows this, but it's a question of whether you can discipline yourself about it. Even if you've written absolute rubbish, you can turn it into something. There's probably something good in there that you can turn into something later. And that's for a later time. Don't worry about it now. Get the thing out. Okay. So that's just an instance of a system that, that the, you know, my, my, whether I'm going to be productive that day or not is kind of unknowable. It's a mystical, strange human thing, right? But I do have a system for writing. And it seems to me that we can all have systems for everything we do that has some kind of creative dimension. Um, just to reaffirm that, I read this actually in sat this Saturday's Guardian ju just gone. The other thing is, in case this is sounding very fuzzy to you, I think everything I've just said does apply to, to um, you know, it might not be creative writing you're doing, maybe you're, you know, devising a new theorem or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, but even, now, even in art, actually, there still is a question that you're trying to answer, okay? It's not a, some kind of strange thing that's completely different to what you as computer scientists or mathematicians will do. There is a question there that you have asked yourself from which you're trying to produce the answer to. Here's a completely different innovation system. Snapchat. Hands up if you use Snapchat. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, maybe two. Um, there's a reason the rest of you haven't used Snapchat, right? Um, but Snapchat's very interesting to me, okay? It's only existed for seven years and it has several hundred million users, right? Not many of us have got several hundred million users, right? Okay. And who was it done by? It was done by three undergraduates at Stanford. Three undergraduates at Stanford, only one of which had technical knowledge. And one of the interesting things about it is if you say what, the, what idea it's predicated on, it'll just sound utterly trivial and not worth bothering with, right? Because the idea of Snapchat was, I send you a message, I'm sorry if you all know this, but I send you a message and it's going to disappear a short time after you receive it. It's just going to go up in a puff of smoke. Those of you who remember, that's not a new idea, of course, if you remember Mission Impossible TV series, I think not many of you are old enough to know that, but there was like actually a physical tape recorder and like the tape would just like literally go up in smoke after they'd heard this special message which told them what they were going to do on their mission. Not a new idea, but it actually solves a very important problem, which is that people, young, young, young people of a certain age, and I'm, I'm, I'm apologise this sounds like I'm speaking, I can't possibly speak for those people, but what I understand from them 
is they have a lot of concerns about what hangs around in cyberspace. Okay? They, they have genuine concerns about that. And these people, these young people like them, realized that and did something about it. And it's a very simple thing, but it's the basis for a whole system which has been wildly successful. So it's, it was innovative, but it was innovative in a way that I think most people in a computer science department wouldn't think was innovative. But it was. And it makes me think of the World Wide Web, which is by several orders of magnitude the most successful distributed computer system that we've ever seen, and which was not made by a computer scientist. It was made by a physicist. And it wasn't made by a computer scientist, and if it had been made by a computer scientist, it would have been object-oriented, and it would have been dead within about five minutes. And we never have the World Wide Web. And it, it is, in fact, the antithesis of object orientation. <coughs> it's content-oriented, not object-oriented. And that's why it works. And that took a physicist to do that. And I'm just trying to sort of paint a picture here about how we have our own little narrow ways of thinking, which aren't necessarily very productive in relation to what, where you would be if you took yourself out of those narrow ways of thinking. And, of course, any particular innovative configuration doesn't, isn't necessarily uh, innovative later on or, or for other purposes. So um, Snapchat is social media, but they tried to go into the idea that one would wear glasses and you'd better take pictures with your glasses and everything. It's a bit like Google Glass, and it's a big <coughs> fail. Okay? So even though they're all sort of down with the youth and they know all about their, their market, they don't actually. And, you know, there is no magic that says one particular innovative configuration continues to be productive. Sorry, one thing. Yeah. Have you seen it's a big thing just in that context? What the... Just in that context. You Google Glass and... Well, Google Glass, of course, has failed. I think I suspect they're working on other things. But Snapchat definitely failed. So this was, this was not doing everything that Google Glass could do. It was purely about having glasses where you could just touch them. I never actually use them, but you can just touch them and take a picture. And it would automatically go on to go into your Snapchat feed. So you can wander around the world going, click, and that goes into my Snapchat feed, my Snapchat story, click, goes into my Snapchat story. It just takes me getting my phone out. Okay. And I'm just saying that that idea, it comes from the people who know all about this, supposedly, but it failed. That's all I'm saying. So I worked at HP Labs for 10 years. There was a completely different culture. 10 minutes, well, okay. Very different culture between, um, oh, in that case, maybe I'll skip a bit actually, I've only got 10 minutes. Is that 10 minutes, and then I'll, we'll have time for questions still. Five minutes. Okay. And skip that. This is where I am now. It's a shared space, and it's a third space, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute, between companies like mine, tech tech companies, in the, mostly in the creative sector, game, make games, do the sort of thing I've talked to you about, whatever, and artists and academics from University of West of England and University of Bristol, all in one space. And the thing about the Pervasive Media Studio is that um, I would argue that exchanging knowledge is not sufficient to bring about high ambition that you need to actually co-produce something. And the reason for that is that by co-producing, first of all, you all have buy-in to something. It's not me having a project and then I try and give it to you. We all agree on what this project is and we work on it collaboratively. And secondly, the fact that we're building something together means that we have common ground. There's a, there's a linguistic theory of common ground. I mean that in a more or less technical sense, that there is an objective reality, this thing that we're making, which mediates all of our communications. So instead of us, me, talking to you about some aspect of, I don't know, operating system kernels that most of you don't know about, let's say, and you thinking you, um, and, and then wonder, we, we kind of wonder whether you've understood what I mean by it and vice versa, um, we actually have an objective thing which we can discuss in the terms that we all use and check our understandings against one another. And that's what's really important about that process. And that's what happens in this space. It happens in a very, very agile timescale compared to a university. Projects that last two to three months. That system I 
described to you earlier, that app for a city, we built that in three months. And that went, that was a ticket, that went to a ticketed event for the public from zero to three months. And that's a typical time scale in my world. Um, it, that's not enough by, by way of research, but it's a really uh, important, that agility and that time scale is really important to the creative function of this space. Other, other aspects of it, that because the world that we're living in is largely from the cultural, artistic um, space, we have producers. Now, I, I'm not sure I still understand exactly what a producer is, but for me, uh, and I think most other people would agree with this, it's kind of like a project manager who also has a role to keep the creative collaboration going. So it's not just about the mechanics of getting the job done, which is partly about that. It's very much about taking the interactions between the multidisciplinary partners in a project and making sure the sparks keep flying between those people. So there's a kind of nurturing, creatively nurturing relationship that producers are involved in um, the flourishing of. The other thing is it's a third space. So this space does not belong to any of these. It actually belongs to an organisation called Watershed in Bristol, which has a 30 year plus history of being a digital media centre. But it's a cinema, it's a bar, it's a cafe, all kinds of things. But it's a place where, which doesn't belong to any of the participating parties. And so everybody is equal in that space. It's not some university saying, come and, come and work on our premises. It's not some business out there saying come and work on our premises. It's a third space for everyone. To, and that's extremely important to the dynamic. And I was research director of the Pervasive Media Studio some time ago when they actually needed one because it all got sort of overtaken by um, funded uh, research programmes. So this is a bit small for you to, to read. But so it's an architecturally and socially embedded engine in a graph of value propagation. So it's part of an, an enormously rich network of, of um, companies, artists, production companies, film companies, BBC, uh, Microsoft, <coughs> Hewlett Packard, very rich network. And um, it's architecturally embedded in the sense that everybody comes to this space. Socially embedded in, in the sense of what we mean by a social network in most cases. And it has a particular set of um, processes by which it does what I call then RNA. So not, not research and development, but research and art. So the, the overall goal was to, was to produ is produce good art. And to do so by absorbing the sorts of technologies that you are working on and I work on. But the technology is, is not there for its own sake. It's there to manifest some bigger meaning. Um, and you have unreasonable expectations. Remember I talked about scepticism, unreasonableness. I use this term in a non-pejorative sense. If you talk to an artist or somebody from a completely different field about your technology, since they don't understand the technology in the same way that you do, but, but they have an ambition with respect to it, they will make unreasonable demands on it, in the sense that they will make demands that are not simply reasonable and therefore not very productive. If you make reasonable demands of something, that's not a very productive thing to do. If I, if I demand of your location system that it doesn't just locate me with respect to a room, but locates me with respect to five centimetres, and you say, but you can't do that, that's a, that's, that's a point when something can happen. But it's not going to say, oh, right, so it only works to, to a room level. Okay, nothing's going to come from that. Critics, observer, evaluators, creative industries, um, citizens, audiences, makers, hackers, universities, all these are represented in the work of this studio. So you have people coming in, just ordinary people from Bristol, but with some kind of artistic project, can come in here, come into the studio, get a residency and work on stuff. 
And the sceptical thing, again, this is the slide I use for my four sceptics talks. You'll see this uh, when I give my talk next Tuesday. Is um, So I carefully distinguish this from cynicism. Scepticism is to demand to know the evidence for something. It's, it's a, it's a you know, hundreds of years old, century, millennia old principle of philosophy and science, right? Is that, that, that one is naturally sceptical about something. But I think my own, my own belief is that by being sceptical about something, um, by understanding it enough to say, well, does that really make sense? And also to understand it at a slightly more meta level, what is the agenda behind the development of that challenge? So, so I will talk about the political agenda behind blockchain next week, for example. Um, in order that, first of all, you inform yourself and others about this technology and the agendas behind it, but also so that one can have a creative response to what you're saying about it. So the idea is not to just stop there, but the idea is to, by being sceptical about something, and, well, really, can it five centimetres? Can you really do location to five centimetres? I mean, why do you want to do location to five centimetres? There's another angle to beat in this sort of creative um, lab idea. So React, this, um, this hub for the Southwest, funded by the AHRC, um, multidisciplinary hubs. This in, in this particular case, it's humanities and uh, technology companies. But of course, a lot of this, I think, can, can pertain to, any, to many other combinations of sectors. A creative hub is an insurgent process, a culture change project. And that's a conversation I want to have with all of you these, this fortnight, actually. How insurgent have you been lately? How, when are you insurgent? If you're not insurgent, why aren't you insurgent? Do you need to be insurgent? What about a bit of subversion? Are there any third spaces that one could talk about that um, could forge new types of collaboration between the university and other entities that you think will further your goals of value? What is driving the process of innovation? Is it um, REF and writing that paper and, and, and making sure you get the four stars? Or is it some broader agenda of social value, for example? Because when, the, 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 again, one of the reports finding is that when things are driven by larger values, the, 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 the bigger the values and the more ambitious the values are, the more productive that space is. I'm not going to say there are rigorous statistics to bear this out. I'm just quoting a report that studied a bunch of hubs around the country um, and looked at, at, at these properties of them. Universities can play a leading role in building networks. This is, again, this is for the creative economy, and there's lots of other parts of the economy that one can look at. Creative economy is not a bad one, because that's 10% of the UK economy. But um, universities can play a leading role. So that's another question I want to ask, is what kind of leadership is there here? Third space is, again, active curation and co-production of networks. All these things are we going to talk about in workshops. Um, I think I'm running out of space. So, where does the computational foundry come? What is its role in an innovation system? To what is that innovation system geared? What are the, what are the shared values that could be driving such a system? How do you organise yourselves in order to maximise your efficacy as an innovative centre? So I'm going to hold uh, a couple of workshops. Um, I'm hoping very much to be attended by far more than computer science and maths. I would be delighted if there are people from, I don't know, geography, drama there. Okay. Um, and those are the um, details of when those workshops are. So I'm giving a workshop this Thursday, just in the morning. 
And there I'm going to focus on your own effectiveness as innovators, a bit like that creative writing thing that I talked about. Your own, your own effectiveness and where you are looking in your innovation, what kind of problems you're looking to solve. Um, Tuesday, I'm going to give a talk on blockchain for skeptics. And Thursday of the following week, I want to look at... Actually, there's going to be a, I'm going to try and divvy it up into quite distinct mornings that potentially people could come independently to. The morning about what big themes and values the computational foundry could orient itself towards that are shared value, values that you all share. And in the morning, uh, in the afternoon, I'll, I'll look at... I'd like us all to look at what it, how to organise ourselves to innovate towards that end. And that is my talk. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, have you, do you have any questions? Yeah.